Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the latest ATS Traffic webinar, Transport Canada's Rail Safety Improvement Program presented by Trainfo and IntelliTraffic. I hope everyone's doing well this Tuesday morning. Definitely, we're doing well here in Edmonton. It's sunny out, and uh, hopefully the sun is shining. And all the other parts of the, uh, the provinces or uh, territories that we're all honing in from. We're going to get started here right away. But before we do, I just have some quick housekeeping items. If you have questions throughout the presentation, feel free to send them our way using the questions tab on your control panel. You should see these questions, or sorry, controls on the top of your screen, and you might have to expand it in order to see the questions chat box. We will get to as many questions as we can following the presentation. And if we can't get to all the questions today, we will make sure to follow up with you. We'll also be sharing and recording this webinar, so keep an eye out for that in your inbox. So again, welcome everyone, and let's get things started. Today's speakers will be Gareth Rempel, the CEO and co-founder of Trainfo, and myself, Wei Robichaud, Program Manager and Product Specialist for ATS Traffic and IntelliTraffic. A little bit about ATS, traffic, and IntelliTraffic. We were founded in 1966. We have four provinces, uh, sorry, branches in four provinces across Canada. Winnipeg, Regina, Saskatoon, Calgary, home office and headquarters in Edmonton, and another office in the Lower Mainland in the Langley area. We are a 3M authorized fabricator, and we are proud to announce that we are a gold standard winner now of the top 50 best managed companies in Canada. A little bit about Intel traffic as well as it's a, I guess, a relatively new division uh, within the ATS traffic group. Um, Intel traffic is, is focused on the future of transportation and offers services and solutions that complement and enhance smart city infrastructure, vulnerable road user considerations and other safety and sustainability initiatives. You can see all the focus areas of uh, this division here on the, the right-hand side of your screens there. Intel traffic text design and architect and implement these innovative solutions. We're able to deliver and service through all of our branches, including the territories, Yukon and Northwest Territories. For the purposes of this webinar, I'm not going to speak uh, directly to each of these points, but I will speak briefly about the smart work zones and how we can take those fundamentals and ideas that we spoke about in our smart work zone presentation about uh, five or six weeks ago and how we've applied these to custom solutions. And then the products that we'll be providing through this program typically make up what we refer to as a smart work zones, but there is a key element of this custom solution that is available through the RCIP funding, which you'll learn more about from Gareth. So smart work zone technology overview and we're going to touch on this very briefly. It's site specific. It's deployed and configured to your site uh, using not too many data points, but not but, but enough data points to gather the information that we're looking for. These data points, whether they're radars, Bluetooth sensors, et cetera, provide real-time information to the motorists and the project team. If there's if, if there's issues you know, within the smart work zone or within the uh, the roadway that these sensors are deployed, messages, texts, emails will all be sent out and everyone is still be able to communicate and log in and understand what's happening in those, in those work zones. The principles are the same though. We want to provide real-time information to motorists at key decision points. This helps us increase safety and mobility while leveraging the real-time data and automation that we've implemented on a smart work zone in a construction site or like we're talking about today for rail safety improvement we're taking those principles that we're using in a construction zone and we're applying them to urban areas areas that we're not typically used to seeing automation and real-time data driven kind of solutions typical products you'd see on an implementation uh, the 3812 Pro Series, the 548 Pro Series, 4880 Pro Series, all of these message boards are uh, built with the urban environment in mind. Smaller footprints, 
uh, but still allowing full matrix displays to send information to the, uh, the traveling public and motorists. The Jam Logic software that helps drive the solution uh, from Trainfo uh, is really driven by data points, raw data input, cameras, speed sensors, weather stations, volume sensors, Bluetooth devices, such as the Trainfo Bluetooth sensor for, for, their, uh, for their solution, as well as you know, other networked data. That all drives into Jam Logic. Jam Logic then pushes that information again out to digital message signs, portable message signs. We can push additional information to places like 511. We can send email and text alerts to emergency services or public officials or, or the public works departments that may be dealing with this. In this case, we could send text or email alerts to Canadian National or Canadian Pacific uh, to let them know that you know, there, there could be some issues on their, on their rail lines. Uh, and we can also industrially send information uh, to dynamic speed signs. So if we're seeing congestion after a rail crossing, with dynamic and connected speed signs, we can actually adjust the speeds throughout that corridor and help get people back to free flow traffic at 60, 50, 40 kilometers an hour, whatever the jurisdiction uh, you know, stipulates there. And that's sort of enough from, from my point of view, uh, but what we're really here today is to learn about the RCIP program, learn about Trainfo, we'll learn about our partnership together. I'll quickly introduce Gareth. Gareth Rappel is the CEO and co-founder of Trainfo and has over 15 years of professional transportation engineering experience working in the public sector, uh, academia, consulting, and the tech industry. He is actively involved in the Transportation Association of Canada, or TAC, and currently serving on its board of directors and chairing the Connected and Automated Vehicle Task Force and co-authoring for national engineering guidelines. Right now, we'll turn over to Gareth to continue the rest of the presentation. Great, thanks, Wade. Um, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the opportunity to present uh, about the Rail Safety Improvement Program uh, to this great audience. I'm looking at the attendee list. There's a lot of familiar people here. So for those of you uh, that I know, hello, welcome. Um, good to see uh, you on the line today. Hopefully you find this webinar useful and uh, informative. So I'm going to try to uh, see if uh, I can advance the slides here. Yep. Okay. So uh, there's my bio. Um, so I'll first start really quickly just about Trainfo because there's, uh, I think, a good number of you who may not have heard of Trainfo before, uh, who we are, what we do. And so I just want to spend a, a moment or two to, to give that background and context. Uh, so the first thing is that uh, Trainfo, we are dedicated to reducing traffic delays and collisions at rail crossings. Um, this is all we do. We focus on rail crossings and uh, how traffic operates around rail crossings. And again, how to improve safety and mobility at these locations. So that's our specialty. Uh, we're a Canadian company. Uh, we were established in 2017, so we're relatively new. Um, really a technology startup company. Uh, we use a lot of uh, computer programming, uh, big data, advanced analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence. So that's really our slant and what we would try to bring to the table um, at rail crossings. Um, we've had a lot of early success. We, we've been recognized uh, internationally and nationally by the U.S. Transportation Research Board, ITS Canada, uh, and the Transportation Association of Canada. Uh, and we've uh, established ourselves as a, as a trusted leader. Uh, we're actually an advisor to the U.S. Federal Railroad Administration. Uh, we've been helping them with innovation at rail crossings and updating their uh, standards and guidelines. Um, and we're also advising the Canadian or the Canada Standards Association, CSA, on connected automated vehicles, particularly as they relate to rail crossings. So a little bit about how Trainfo works. Um, and so I'll just walk you through it uh, real quickly here. Uh, the first thing uh, about us is that we have a proprietary data set. Um, and that comes from our um, proprietary train detection sensors uh, that we install next to rail crossings. Uh, our sensors are installed off rail property, so you don't have to worry about um, getting approval from the railroads to install our, our sensors. This can all be done off rail property. And what that does is it allows us to collect and obtain real-time train data. 
The other thing that we do is we bring in other sources of vehicle data. Um, so Bluetooth sensors, GPS devices on vehicles, and we uh, collect that data as well. And so once we have those two pieces of information, um, that's all being sent up wirelessly to our cloud servers. And here's where we have uh, some patented uh, machine learning processes uh, where we actually predict traffic delay uh, and train arrival time uh, at rail crossings using those real-time data sources um, from trains and vehicles like I just mentioned. So that's all happening uh, with the software that we developed. And once that's in our cloud, uh, now we can do all sorts of things with it. And this is where we partner with ATS and IntelliTraffic. Um, you know, we can start uh, providing some different types of applications. We can send data from our cloud, um, uh, interact with the Jamlogic software that Wade just mentioned, uh, and start uh, giving information to drivers to help them reroute around blocked rail crossings, uh, reduce uh, collision exposure and, and accidents. Uh, we can also integrate into traffic signals or into advanced traffic management centers. Uh, and here we give engineers the tools uh, to predict when uh, a rail crossing will be blocked, how much traffic delay that will cause, uh, really insightful data on how to develop traffic signal timing plans uh, to prepare for these events, to help mitigate the impact of, of trains on traffic and restore traffic back to normal as quickly as possible. And another thing that, that we work on right now is, is integrating into emergency dispatch software. And uh, here again, we can give advanced information, predictive information to emergency vehicles to help dispatchers reroute uh, an ambulance or a fire truck. Uh, in some cases, they actually uh, call on a different station on the other side of the tracks that might be a little bit further away, but won't be impacted by a train. And so these are just some of the, the applications that we're working on right now. Um, for this presentation, I'm gonna be focusing more so on the, the roadside signs, a little bit on the traffic signals as they pertain to RCIP. Uh, last slide about us. Um, so this is just a picture of our train detection sensor. It's like I mentioned, installed off rail property. Um, it can be installed on traffic signals, light standards, utility poles, or just a, a custom pole. Um, you know, they're, they're not that large. Our sensor is about the size of a shoebox, a little bit larger. Uh, they get strapped onto a pole. Uh, you turn them on and uh, they start detecting trains. Uh, here's an example of uh, a sign uh, from ATS um, where we uh, installed this in Winnipeg and we were providing train crossing information to uh, drivers uh, approaching a rail crossing in Winnipeg. And, and what this was doing was a couple of things. Um, this sign was about one mile ahead of a rail crossing. And so it was telling drivers, listen, there's a train at the crossing ahead. We would also flip the sign message and say, here's how much traffic delay to expect. And that allowed drivers to say, okay, I'm not gonna rush and try to beat the train in case there is one. Um, I know how much uh, delay there is, I'm okay with it. Or they could say, you know what, I also have uh, some time here and an opportunity to take a detour and reroute. So that's why it was placed you know, about a mile ahead to allow drivers to have that flexibility. Uh, and that's something that um, offers a lot of, uh, not only traffic mobility benefits, but safety benefits. And it's one of the reasons why Transport Canada uh, is funding uh, these types of solutions through the RCIP program. Um, it can help reduce vehicle exposure and traffic volumes at rail crossings. And, and when you do that, you reduce collision risk. Um, it can address those impatient drivers who, you know, I think we've all experienced them, um, who are rushing towards rail crossings, unsure if there's going to be a train, trying to beat the train uh, and can be driving erratically and, and dangerously in doing so. Um, it can also um, prevent certain types of rear end collisions in certain cases uh, where you might have a blind curve or something like that where there's an unexpected queue building up from a rail crossing blockage. And so these are just some of the safety benefits that this type of uh, technology can provide. Uh, and then another picture here of uh, what we did in Winnipeg again, inter, um, uh, integrating into their traffic management center. And so this was their wall of screens like many traffic management centers have. They actually had a screen with our data um, it's, uh, you know, this one right here, where it shows live rail crossing information and they were able to adjust their traffic signals in real time. Um, and so, you know, we're relatively new, but we've had a lot of success in different uh, cities. Some of you are from these cities. Um, and so, uh, you know, we are deployed quite widely in Canada and, and already in, into the US. So that's uh, all about uh, Trainfo for now. Um, I'll, I'll jump into RCIP uh, here. And there's basically, 
three questions uh, I want to address here that you might be having, and hopefully this uh, presentation can answer. Uh, it is, first of all, what is RSIP, the Rail Safety Improvement Program? Uh, should you apply for it? And if you do apply, how do you do so? So we'll start with what is RSIP and, and a really high level overview. Um, the Rail Safety Improvement Program, this is a federal government initiative uh, and it applies to projects at both provincially and federal, federally regulated rail crossings. So it, it can be both you know, the, the big ones, CNCP crossings and, and others. And the objectives of this program are to you know, obviously improve rail safety to reduce injuries and fatalities at rail crossings, and that might be you know, where, where you're most involved in, and also to increase public confidence in Canada's rail transportation system. And you know, there's some undertones here with you know, certain events in Canada like Lac Megantique and, and things like that to try to avoid those types of catastrophic events. Uh, there's two components to RSIP. Uh, there's a public education and awareness component. Um, this is often uh, you know, applied for. Operation Lifesaver will, will often use funding from this program to help with their marketing and advertising campaigns and awareness. Uh, I'm not going to cover that part in this presentation. The, the, the deadline for those applications were actually is passed already anyway. What's probably more applicable to you is this other component, the infrastructure, technology, and research component. Um, research, a bit more applicable to universities. Uh, technology, a little bit more applicable to private companies. It's probably the infrastructure uh, aspect of, of this that's most relevant to you, and, and I'll focus on that in this presentation. So starting with eligible recipients, um, again, looking at the attendee list, I, I would think almost everyone here is, is eligible, but it includes public agencies and organizations uh, that you can see listed here, provinces, territories, municipalities, regional governments, road, even transit authorities, uh, indigenous communities, groups and organizations, and crown corps like via rail uh, and then there's others as well uh, you know for-profit organizations not-for-profit organizations including universities and even individuals uh, can apply so quite, quite broad uh, the next question that's often asked is well how much funding is actually available and so this is a program that's been going on uh, since um, 2015 or so uh, it's been getting renewed in, in three-year chunks. And so we're into the next three-year renewal. Uh, there's $65.1 million uh, available between 2021 and 2023 inclusive. Uh, and within that funding, um, there are certain limits. Uh, there's $10 million max uh, contribution per recipient and $500,000 max grant per recipient. And so a contribution um, agreement that is a bit more milestone based, uh, it's they're, they're um, auditing uh, the work that's being done uh, and that type of thing. There's a lot more reporting going on. Grants have a lot less reporting and auditing. Uh, it's you know like you would expect a, a grant uh, just being handed out as long as your project meets the um, objectives of the program. And then there's uh, 25,000, up to $25,000 max amount to uh, close a crossing if that's what you choose to do. Uh, also part of the, the federal funding is that as a public agency, which I think most of you are on the line, 80% um, of project costs are covered by RSIP uh, for public agency pro projects. Uh, there's a little caveat there uh, that if your project includes work that's done on rail property, the work that's on the rail property is only reimbursed at 50%. And so, um, those are just a couple of things to keep note of. 80% for any work uh, that's on, on public property, 50% if it's on railroad property. And again, these costs are reimbursed. So you have to front the, the cash up front uh, and then get reimbursed for eligible costs. Okay, uh, we'll keep moving along here. There we go. Uh, so in terms of the funding, uh, the last round of funding that was distributed was 2019-2020. Uh, we're still waiting for this fiscal year's results, which should be coming any week now. Uh, but the last period that we have data for, there were 136 total projects. Uh, 41 of those RSIP projects were from municipalities and, and public agencies. The others were universities or the railroads themselves. 
Um, a total amount of funding uh, provided that year was 16.5 million, $6 million went to municipal projects. The average municipal project size was $185,000. The smallest project was in Wapella, Saskatchewan, uh, $7,500. The largest project was also in Saskatchewan. It was close to 700,000. And really what, what I'm trying to show here, and you know this table, you can glance over it, is that it doesn't matter if you're a large or a small um, population or an agency. It doesn't matter if you have a big project or a small project. Uh, RCIP is quite flexible and can provide funding uh, to you wherever you're at. So um, you know, as you can see, there's really no project too small, not a lot of projects that are too big. Um, and certainly geography uh, and population doesn't play all that critical of a role as long as there's a safety need. Uh, the next question about what is RCIP is uh, what are the eligible types of projects? And so I kind of prefaced this at the beginning, there's infrastructure improvements, there's technology and research and development, and there's cross enclosures. And again, for those of you on the line, you know, cross enclosures might be uh, something on your mind. Uh, but it's probably the infrastructure improvements that are, are most interesting to you. Uh, here, the program can fund the implementation of flashing lights, bells, and gates if you need to upgrade a crossing. Uh, for some of the larger projects like rate separation, that's also eligible. Um, and a whole host of different ITS or intelligent transportation system technology projects are also eligible. Um, and as you probably um, uh, you know, guess by now, you know, that that's really where train phone and teletraffic come in and, and have a lot of strength is in providing ITS technologies as part of RCIP. And again, that's, you know, referencing this picture here on the, the top left, providing these real time and predictive information systems for drivers uh, to help re reroute drivers around block crossing to reduce that exposure risk. Um, and uh, just address those impatient drivers as well and, and the dangerous activities they engage in. And uh, so those are, these are the types of projects that, that are eligible uh, and that you can apply for funding. Okay, there we go. Sorry, I have a bit of a lag on my um, screen shifting here. Uh, so, under eligible expenses. So I started with eligible expenses and it was actually a shorter list to talk about what's ineligible. Um, so that just gives you a sense again of how broad this program is, is that it, it covers a lot of the project costs that you can expect. Um, most of these are pretty intuitive and obvious. Um, maybe one that's not is maintenance costs. So RCIP is not designed to help with your maintenance budget and uh, maintain your existing systems or you know flashing lights bells and gates and inspections like that it's meant to uh, introduce new types of measures to improve uh, rail safety um, but other than that you know like Wade said this will be provided to you afterwards um, but these uh, what's not eligible is pretty straightforward and, and intuitive hopefully you can can read that uh, uh, on this slide Uh, the next question now is, should you apply for RCIP now that you know a little bit about it? Um, so RCIP may be right for you if uh, you have a rail crossing that has had a collision in the past five years. That's one potential criteria. If you have citizens that are complaining about rail crossings and you have some documentation about those complaints. If you have a crossing that's been identified as a higher risk of a collision. And so there are different ways to rank crossings, Transport Canada has lists, you might have your own internal list. Um, there's different models that you can use to, to um, estimate future risk. Uh, so that's another uh, thing to consider. If you have emergency vehicles that are delayed by trains, uh, that's another reason to apply for RCIP. And again here, if you want to reduce traffic delays at rail crossings, uh, there's increasingly awareness and agreement that um, if you can reduce traffic delays, you can improve safety. There is a link between these two uh, ideas, mobility and safety. And uh, so there's more and more recognition, like I said, for programs like RCIP, um, which are focused on safety to recognize that if we reduce traffic delays, we can also achieve our objectives. So these aren't necessary um, mandatory criteria that I'm listing here. This just gives you a sense that if you're having these issues in your jurisdiction, you might be a pretty good candidate for this program. 
Uh, if you do apply, there's certain project selection criteria that Transport Canada uses. The first one, obviously, probably is uh, safety criteria. Uh, so if you have uh, high collision uh, history and data to back that up, if you have high train and traffic volumes and high speeds, if you have a crossing that's uh, at a skew angle, if you have a lot of tracks and multi lanes, uh, if you don't have a lot of existing protection, and if you actually have had a Transport Canada rail inspector um, look at your crossing and, and write up a report or provide some recommendations, these are all really good uh, things to have in terms of um, being eligible for RCIP. Uh, if you pass those safety criteria, uh, they'll look at the project itself. And what Transport Canada is looking for is collaboration. So they'll be looking uh, for you to work with others, uh, whether it's other uh, departments within your uh, public agency or whether it's with railroads or whoever, the, they'll be looking for that. It's not mandatory, but it helps. Uh, and you know they'll be looking for value for money. And I think that's pretty obvious as well. They want a lot of bang for their buck and uh, the highest safety improvements. And then finally, they'll actually be looking at the applicants as well. Um, they'll be looking for relevant experience of the uh, applicant team and, and who's gonna be working on this project, uh, whether there's capacity to complete it, um, especially financially, you have to show some financials. Um, and this last one is actually really important, a high quality application. I'll expand on this a little bit later, but um, this is really talking about data-driven business cases, uh, quantifying the problem, quantifying the expected uh, benefits, uh, and this is where most applications um, actually get rejected, is that is, there's just not a lot of data um, and high quality analysis that's going to support these applications. Um, the actual application process is pretty straightforward. Um, you know, you, you identify rail crossing issues to address. You might have these documented already. You might want to collect some data ahead of time to, to uh, bolster your application. Uh, so you obtain that data, you might want to get some letters of support as well, maybe from the rail crossings or from um, citizens or, or community groups or whoever's concerned with it. Um, you'll want to confirm all your sources of funding. Again, um, you'll have to come up with 20% uh, funding. Some of that can be in kind uh, as well, uh, but all of this is reimbursable. So you have to have 100% of the project funding available up front so that Transport Canada can reimburse you. Um, you have to develop a preliminary project scope, uh, including a schedule and budget. It's not too detailed. Um, you know, we're talking um, uh, the schedule happening over fiscal years um, and, you know, budgets having maybe, you know, five to ten line items, something like that. It's a pretty basic uh, schedule and budget, but you have to have something in mind. Um, they prefer projects that are in the one to two year time frame. So um, they probably won't fund projects that are longer than two years. Um, one year is, is kind of maybe a bit of a, uh, where the majority of projects lie. Um, and then you have to submit the application through an online data portal. And so there's a special uh, GC key, Government of Canada key identification that you need to register for. And uh, then there's an online field and, and a bunch of pages to uh, submit your information into through that online data portal. Uh, in terms of timeline, so you know we're kind of here today on this this timeline that that I'll show you. Um, August first uh, is the application deadline, so there's just over a month right now to get that application in. Uh, that still leaves you time. I'll go through a little bit more about what the application process is like. Um, so there is time, but you know also it's not something that you want to put off uh, much longer if you're thinking about applying. Application results um, are supposed to come in uh, at the end of fiscal year for the federal government, which is March 31st. Um, like I mentioned before, we're, we're still waiting to get the results from last year's applications and we're, you know, we're until late June now. So um, uh, you can expect a, a result in the meantime or in that time frame. And then usually if you have a contribution agreement, um, it's ending around March 31st, 2022. So the following fiscal year. Um, but like I mentioned, a, a two-year project is, is still eligible. One other thing to note about these deadlines is that you can reimburse costs all the way back up until your application deadline. So um, you could apply, submit your application August 1st this year, already get going on, on that work, not knowing whether you're going to be uh, reimbursed through RCIP. Um, if you do get uh, approved, 
you can get reimbursed for all that work up until August 1st. So, um, you know, they do go retroactive uh, to reimburse expenses up until the application um, date. Uh, a little bit more about how to apply and what to expect. Uh, the application has 11 sections and about 60 questions or details and, and parts to complete. Uh, some of it is fairly straightforward. There's basic information like your applicant information, some high level project details, your contact information. Um, there's some things about uh, work site details. Uh, so here would be you know, the road name, um, the existing protection that's available at the crossing. Um, number five would be some of the upgrade options that you're thinking about. Uh, it can include um, you know, putting in ITS technologies, flashing lights and bells, signage, uh, in improvements to road approaches and, and grade crossing surfaces. So that's a, a place where you can put that. If your project will have environmental impacts, if it's near a, a body of water, you'll have to put in some information about that. Um, number seven, again, this is really important. So this is quantifying the safety issue at the crossing. The improvements that you're planning to put in and the benefits that you expect from those improvements and really backing it up with strong data, strong analysis. There's some rail details and, and road details uh, to provide as well in the application. Um, you know, these are um, in, in the rail part, it's whether you've contacted the railway authority, whether you're um, sharing costs with them. Um, something that, that has come up with uh, some of the cities that we've helped is that uh, Transport Canada will come to the city or the municipality after the application has been uh, submitted and they'll say we just want to make sure that the railroad knows what you're planning to do here and that you've submitted this um, application and so um, expect that to happen if it's not already in your application to demonstrate that the railroad knows what you're planning to do is okay with it and ideally is, is partnering and, and cooperating. Um, again, you have to show the project cash flow, uh, very simple and basic, but you do have to show it. And then there's a place for supporting documents. And these could be uh, Transportation Safety Board investigation reports. Uh, it could be rail safety and information letters. It could be uh, feasibility studies, business cases. There, there's all sorts of different supporting documents you can provide. Uh, getting close to the end now of this part, and then we'll, we'll get into questions. Um, so. You know, sticking with how you apply, there, there's some tips for success. So we've uh, been doing this. Trainfo has been, you know, applying for RSIP, helping other municipalities apply for RSIP, talking to Transport Canada about what's good and what works and, and, and what should be improved on. And, and we've kind of come up with three top tips that we wanted to share with you. Uh, the first one, you know, I've mentioned this a couple of times, but wanted to mention it again because it's so important. Uh, it's so important to quantify the problem and the proposed benefits. And so there's some tools uh, that you can go to and turn to, to to support this. One is Transport Canada's Grade Crossing Inventory Database. This is uh, publicly available on their website. Uh, you might have your own inventory database that you can reference. Uh, there's also the Rail Occurrence Database. This gives details about historical collisions and some of the causes and some of the narrative around it. Um, the University of Waterloo uh, is the steward for GradeX. If you haven't heard about GradeX, uh, it, it's a website uh, that you need uh, credentials to log into. Uh, but what, once you do, you can actually use their models. It, it's a, a collision risk modeling tool uh, at its core. It does a few other things as well, but at its core, it, it models collision risk at a rail crossing. And you can go to any crossing that you have and you can look at what does the model say the collision risk is at, at your particular location that you're interested in. And you can start you know, playing with those numbers. You can say, okay, this is the number of collisions in the next five years or 10 years to expect. If I put in, if I upgrade from a cross buck to flashing lights, what's the expected benefit at this location? And you can play around with different uh, traffic volumes and, and things like that to get some really good um, information. And then there's also you know, data that we provide. Um, so we can really measure uh, traffic delay, especially at a rail crossing and the number of blockages and the, and the impact of these traffic delays and how putting in driver information systems can help reduce traffic delays, help reduce traffic exposure at rail crossings. Again, to quantify uh, the potential benefit of a traveler information system. Tip number two uh, is to obtain railroad support. Um, that's something that Transport Canada is really, really interested in. 
from a number of perspectives, um, but really just to improve relations between uh, public agencies and the railway authorities and to uh, help foster more collaboration. And finally, uh, the last tip is to use a rail, rail crossing safety expert. Like I mentioned, most of the application, applications are rejected uh, because they just aren't put together that well. Um, and so if you can use a rail crossing safety expert, you can increase your chances. And that's something that we wanted to offer uh, to you potentially and that we've offered in the past. Um, last year, we helped seven cities apply for two and a half million dollars in RCIP funding. Uh, and we did this free of charge um, for the projects that we're looking to use traveler information systems. Um, we are obviously really interested in um, improving rail safety and uh, we want to use our experience in applying for RCIP and pass it along to you. And so that would be what we would be uh, looking for from you is, is to contact us to see if, if that's something you're interested in. We'd love to talk to you about it um, and just see if, if we can offer that to you and if we can get uh, you some RCIP funding. And basically what we've been able to do is reduce the effort of uh, applicants, of public agency applicants by up to 90%. Um, and it, it's something that you know, we, we hope is, is beneficial. So in, in terms of uh, next steps uh, from this webinar, um, you can contact us um, to learn more about RCIP if you just wanna talk about it, or to see if uh, you, know, you wanna talk about an application and, and how we can work with you to do that. Uh, there are three ways you can get in touch with us. Uh, we have a special RCIP page, uh, www.rcip.trainfo.ca. Uh, you can go through our regular website, uh, trainfo.ca slash contact, or you can just email us, contact at trainfo.ca. Any one of these ways, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get back to you uh, about RCIP. And I think these uh, links will also be shared with you after the webinar as well. Uh, so you don't have to quickly jot them down if you don't want. Um, once you do contact us, um, we'll schedule a call with you and we'll try to learn more about your situation, uh, about the crossing, and to see if there's a potential project uh, as, as a candidate. And so we'll help you determine your eligibility for RCIP funding and, and whether we can actually uh, complete your application on your behalf. Um, and that will involve us you know, developing an initial project idea based on that discussion, developing a preliminary scope of work, uh, letting you review it, change it, update it, make it fit your needs uh, until you're happy with it, and then we can submit it on your behalf. Um, so this is just expanding on what I, I just talked about, that we'll gather information. Um, some of it we might need to request from you. You might have it in your databases. Uh, we'll reach out to the railroad to make sure that they're aware of everything and, and are, are on board. And like I mentioned, we'll complete the application, including the project description, the cost, the data analysis, the project benefits, uh, and finally submit it through the online data portal using the, the GC key that, that we have. Um, so that's something that, um, you know, hopefully it is a benefit to you and, a, and of interest to you. We'd love to talk to you about that. Um, that's really uh, the end of this uh, presentation. Uh, there's a couple of uh, quotes, uh, you know, from people who we've worked with in the past. Last year, we helped Edmonton apply for RCIP. They were really happy uh, with the process. And, and so we were happy about that. Um, City of Seattle, obviously not an RCIP candidate, but they've been really happy with um, what we've done in their city and uh, really happy with, with uh, the data we've provided. So that, that concludes uh, you know, my part of the presentation. Um, like I mentioned, we wanted to leave some time here for questions. If you have some, I haven't seen uh, many come up in the, the chat box yet, uh, but at this point, um, you know, I'll start, stop my presentation and, and pass it back to, uh, to Wade and to ATS uh, to take over from here. So thank you. Excellent, thank you very much, Gareth. Uh, really informative uh, presentation there today. Um, like Gareth was mentioning, uh, we're gonna get to get some questions now. So if you have uh, a question, please feel free to type into the questions box and uh, we're sitting here uh, kind of waiting to uh, moderate those questions and we can uh, either answer them out uh, directly to Gareth or myself. Um, we did have one question that came in earlier um, and it was, uh, is the driver info system wireless? Um, I'm not sure exactly what we're, you know, we're questioning there on the driver info system. Um, so if you were the one that asked that question, if you could just elaborate briefly into the questions box, uh, driver info from ATS, uh, JamLogic or Vermac point of view, or the driver system from the Trainfo point of view, we can uh, we can answer that question.
Yeah, and, and and while they're uh, they're retyping the question, if, if from our side, from from the Trainfo side, everything is wireless or can be wireless. Um, that's the default. Um, so our train detection sensor goes up on a pole. Um, it uh, it communicates wirelessly through um, cellular data to our cloud, and then from our cloud, it goes down to wherever you want it to go. It can go wireless uh, to the the roadside sign again through uh, Jam Logic software and and the ATS uh, message boards, um, and it can go you know really wherever you want. It can be wireless, it can be hardwired, but the wireless option is certainly there. Excellent. Yes, thank you, Gareth. And uh, and from ATS's perspective as well, all of our solutions that do connect with the Trainfo system are all uh, wireless solutions. We have another uh, question here. Uh, have any provincial road agencies applied yet? If so, for what type of projects were they successful in their RSIP application for funding? This is definitely uh, directed towards uh, Gareth there. Yes, yeah, and I can see uh, it's uh, from uh, Walter Bird. So good, good, good friend, uh, colleague of mine. So good to, to hear your good question. Um, so yes, uh, provincial road authorities, um, they, they are applying uh, for this as well. Um, and uh, the, the types of applications that, that have been successful with the solution uh, have been kind of the example I laid out uh, with the city of Winnipeg is a roadside message board um, at various strategic locations on the road network. Um, usually, you know, a, a, again, at a certain distance upstream of a rail crossing, enough that drivers can reroute if they want to, or to prevent that aggressive driving towards a rail crossing. Um, and so that's one component, definitely the message board for drivers. Uh, the other parts of those projects include the train detection sensors, and those get installed uh, next to the, the rail crossing. And oftentimes there's also a vehicle detection sensor as well, Bluetooth uh, traffic sensors. These are again, our, our little boxes that are installed uh, in the road right of way. Um, usually, you know, 30 meters or less from uh, the, the travel lanes and the vehicles. And so all of those three components, the train sensors, the vehicle sensors and the roadside signs, um, all communicating uh, wirelessly uh, into the cloud and back and vice versa, two-way communication to let drivers know that there's a train up ahead, to uh, let them know how much delay to expect, and in some cases, even providing reroute guidance and advice. Um, you know, as a, as a rail safety, um, for myself with a rail safety background and just a traffic safety background, something that's important, just a little nugget of information, is that we are very careful about the messages we put on these signs. We don't want to encourage drivers to speed towards a rail crossing. So one thing that we discourage strongly is to tell a driver that a train is approaching. Uh, we just only want to tell them that the train is already there. It, there there's no point in trying to beat it. It's already there. Uh, we also don't want to reroute vehicles into streets and, and places where uh, we don't want that. For example, like a residential street. We won't, wouldn't want to take people off of a highway or off of a major arterial and direct them towards uh, residential streets. So hopefully that, that answers your, your question, uh, Walter. Um, but yes, provincial um, road agencies have been successful. Excellent, thank you, Gareth. Uh, we got a couple more questions here. Um, one of them uh, here from Derek. Uh, what about private landowners with grade crossings? Most of them are farmers that the railway companies are asking them to pay for upgrades. Can they too apply? Yeah, my understanding is is that they can. And again, you know, right at the beginning of the presentation, the, the types of rail crossings that are eligible are provincially and federally regulated rail crossings. So um, if that's the case uh, for a private landowner, if it's provincially regulated or federally regulated, uh, it should be eligible. Um, and again, an eligible recipient is also just an individual. And so there is some flexibility to accommodate those types of situations. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, we've got a couple more here, Gareth. Uh, one from Trevor. Uh, sorry, uh, I, I think uh, Aya, uh, if I'm saying that right. Uh, is right of way seniority a factor? Okay, um, I might need a bit more context to that question. I'm not totally sure what uh, is meant by right of way seniority. Um, Wade, maybe maybe you know. Um, not to quite sure what you're what you're getting at there, Aya. We'll, uh, we'll wait uh, to see a response here in the uh, in the questions here. 
Um, I think uh, we'll move on to the next question and I will get back to your question there. Uh, we have one from Trevor. Does the signage have uh, train flow quality control to ensure there is no unnoticed failures or is there a requirement to physically check each sign daily? Yeah, good question. Um, and so the short answer is there are a number of checks and balances in place that are happening automatically and remotely uh, with the system. So um, a little bit of background on, on our train detection sensor. We actually are using microphones and sound as our train detection um, approach. And so um, we have microphones right beside the, the crossing and it's very obvious when um, there's a train, the microphone will pick it up, um, it'll hear bells, it will hear everything that you expect to hear at a rail crossing, it's, it's very obvious. Um, and so we can jump in and we can um, actually listen to those sound files to make sure that uh, a train is being detected when it should be detected. And so that auditing goes on 24 seven, it's a regular, thing to, to ensure quality. Uh, in terms of the, the sign, again, there are um, automatic um, um, alerts that if we're not connected to the sign or connected to any other uh, part of the system, there'll be an alert saying there's a communication line down or some, there's an issue to, to address. Those are automatic alerts, again, happening automatically, happening remotely, and we'll get flagged. And most of the time, those are very simple fixes. A lot of the time we can actually send a fix wirelessly. So it might be a software update. It might just be a, a little reset that needs to happen. And that can be controlled uh, from our cloud and, and remotely as well. So um, that's from our perspective, you know, the, the maintenance that goes on. Um, Wade, I don't know if you want to talk about any of the, the physically checking the sign or anything uh, on that end. Yeah, in terms of uh, in terms of the signage uh, uh, out there, uh, digital message boards or the permanent ones is uh, you know dependent on what the installation uh, has. Um, all of our signs are cellular, uh, cellularly connected, so uh, from a remote uh, internet connection, whether on your phone, your tablet PC, your desktop PC, anywhere in the world that you have uh, connectivity, you can dial in uh, to the Jamlogic uh, central server software and look at the status of your boards. Uh, whether they're uh, gathering enough uh, solar, um, what the output is, uh, what the current message is displayed on there. Uh, there's a few other kind of features and stuff that are built into Jamlogic that we can also get into. But I don't want to, you know, go down a rabbit hole and talk about uh, Jamlogic too much. So if you're uh, interested in, in more of how the technology works uh, from a software perspective, um, we'd be happy to reach out to you and uh, do a very customized uh, presentation uh, for you specifically on, on that end of things. Uh, we've got another uh, question here um, from uh, Martins. Uh, have you had positive feedbacks and meaningful collaborations with the major class ones regarding your ITS projects? Yes, good question. And uh, the, the short answer, again, I'll start with the short answer. The short answer is yes, we, we've had positive feedback and meaningful collaboration with major class ones. Um, and to expand on that, um, that's been a, a key focus of ours from day one is to be partners and positive contributors to the rail crossing industry. And uh, so, so much so that, you know, it, we, we've actually had a lot of good traction uh, with CN and CP and, and, and BNSF and UP as well uh, and some of the other major class ones uh, to the point where we've actually had some endorsements uh, by some of the, the major class ones. Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, a municipality will approach them, uh, you know, about a rail crossing issue or wanting data. And we've actually had class one railroads refer those municipalities to us uh, as an option. So um, being on the right side with the railroads is really important to us. I think, you know, the, the way to maximize safety benefits is that everyone is working together, uh, pulling in the same direction. And uh, so again, going back to the short answer, yes, positive feedback and lots of meaningful collaboration and communication. Okay, excellent. Uh, we've got another one here uh, from Steve. Uh, does the system have to be connected to the cloud or is it still uh, viable in remote locations with no cell coverage? Yeah, um, so ideally it's, it's designed as a cloud first system. Um, there are, and, and you know, you could probably gather that, you know, the terms of the, the communication of data going up to the cloud is wireless, the monitoring the system is wireless, the communication to drivers is wireless. So it's definitely wireless cloud first. 
Um, that's where you get a lot of the benefits in terms of ensuring the, you know, the quality control, the predictive aspect of the system, and uh, just the, and, and actually the cost too. When you have things wireless, the, the cost can go down. Um, so there are ways to do this uh, without the cloud, uh, but you'll lose some of that. You'll lose some of the, the remote monitoring maintenance um, benefits. You'll, the cost will go up, maybe in certain cases, depending on how remote, quite a bit. Um, so it, it's possible, um, but you know, it's, it's, I, I don't want to comment too much further than that, other than to say, you know, it's, it's probably case by case. We definitely um, could talk about it in more detail and look at the specific situation. Uh, but again, short answer is this is really a cloud first, wireless first system that could be adapted to uh, remote locations with no cell coverage. Exactly. Uh, thanks, Gareth. And, and speaking to uh, to the Vermac uh, kind of uh, components of the system, the Jamlogic components, um, again, it is sort of a cellularly connected system. Now, we have had some recent successes uh, in the Northwest Territories and the uh, the government of the Yukon uh, installing uh, BGAN, uh, basically BGAN satellite modems uh, into the trailers uh, to have remote connectivity um, in the in the kind of areas of uh, of the Yukon and Northwest Territories where there is essentially zero cellular coverage. Um, but these are very beginning stages of successes with the BGAN technology. Um, so again, going back to what Gareth said, yes, it is a a cloud-based system first, but on a case-by-case, -case, we can definitely dive in to see if the, the solution is viable uh, with a satellite feature. Again, the, the cost may significantly increase though, uh, due to the costs of uh, satellite data. We've got another uh, question here from John. Is funding available for crossing protection at proposed crossings or is it limited to existing crossings? Yeah, good. Another good question. All these have been really good questions. Um, so far, I haven't seen RCIP funding being applied to proposed crossings. Um, I, I would definitely defer. I would have to uh, go to Transport Canada to give you a definitive answer. My guess at this point, and it, it is just a guess, is that it would not be applicable. And the reason why I think that is that there has to be um, a demonstrated uh, issue that is, is needing to be solved um, with the crossing itself, um, not at a new crossing. Um, you know, I think at, at new crossings, uh, you'd be expected to follow the grade crossing standards and regulations and, and implementing all the treatments that are prescribed. Uh, by those documents and if there's an issue or, or a safety problem after doing what's prescribed uh, RCIP could come in and, and top that up but again that's that just to be clear that's my guess um, I can definitely talk to Transport Canada about that and get back to you and I think that was uh, John um, Midori and so if you follow up with me with an email or if I get your contact information uh, I can uh, follow up and uh, be a bit more uh, certain on that answer Okay, fantastic. Uh, Gareth, we have a, a going back to Aya there. Um, the, the original question was, is right of way seniority a factor? And then the follow up to that was, right of way seniority uh, affects the cost share amounts under RCIP. Okay, um, that helps a bit. I'm going to try to maybe um, interpret that and um, wondering if, um, if this has to do with right of way seniority in terms of the railroads versus uh, public agencies. So, you know, in most cases, the railroad has the right of way authority that, um, you know, any crossing is, is um, happening on their property that they are allowing a road to go across their rail line. Um, so I, I, that, that's what I'm guessing is, is what you're meaning by right of way seniority. Um, and in terms of the cost share amount with that context, um, it's really the applicant um, that would be applying for cost sharing or for reimbursement. And uh, like I mentioned earlier in the, the presentation, any work that's done on public right of way uh, will be reimbursed up to 80%. Any work that's on uh, private property um, and the, the railroad property, that work and that component of the work would be reimbursed at 50%. So, um, Railroads do apply for RCIP, uh, so sometimes they, they will get funded for work that they do. They'll be reimbursed at 
there are public agency projects that are entirely on public right of way. Um, and again, the system that, that that I've been describing to you that we've done with ATS and, and the message boards, that's entirely on public right of way. And so as a public agency applying for that funding for that project, uh, there would be 80% reimbursement funding available. So hopefully that, that ant I interpreted your question right and, and that the answer is what you're looking for. All right, thanks, Gareth. Um, that looks like uh, we're at the end here of our, our question period. Does anyone have uh, any other last minute questions before we close off for the, uh, for the morning? Yeah, so I'll, I'll just say that if, if you do, if a question does come to mind afterwards, after the webinar, uh, again, the, the, our contact information will be provided. You can reach out anytime. I uh, would love to talk to you about anything rail crossing safety related. Um, you know, that's our passion. So um, feel free to reach out anytime. All right, wonderful. Thanks, Gareth. Uh, well, you know what? Uh, I think we're uh, we're right down to the wire here. Uh, I don't know if we've answered. Uh, oh, we've got one question that's coming in uh, right, at the, right at the last moment here. Does private property funding up to 50% also apply to private landowners? Yeah, my understanding is that if it's on private uh, property and it, it's a private uh, entity and individual uh, applying for funding, uh, that it, it's 50% reimbursed. Um, and so I think that's by default, that's the, the rule of RCIP. Um, I'm not sure if Transport Canada can make exceptions uh, in certain cases to help private individuals out, but I, my understanding is the default is that if it's on private property, a private uh, applicant, uh, it would be 50% reimbursement. Okay, excellent, thanks Gareth. Well, I think uh, I think we're gonna close off here for the morning. Thank you very much for, uh, for attending this morning. I will be sending out the recording of the webinar, as well as all of the resource links mentioned in those last few slides. If you'd like to learn more about the RCIP program and how Trainfo and ATS traffic can help you with your upcoming rail crossing project, I do encourage you to check out the links provided for more information or reach out to your ATS sales rep or your representative there, Gareth, uh, at uh, Trainfo, if you have any questions uh, regarding the topics that we covered today. With that, I want to thank Gareth again for all of his insights today. Thank you all for joining us. Have a great day, and we'll see you on the next webinar.